How do privacy laws relate to ethics and institutional norms? U.S. privacy laws are based on certain fairness principles that emerged in the 70s and 80s in the U.S. and Europe in response to the rise of computing and large-scale data processing. These principles attempted to balance the benefits of computing with concerns about how computers might threaten privacy. There are various formulations of these fair information practices, but they boil down to the following. Tell people what data you are collecting, using, sharing, and maintaining, and why. Get their consent whenever practicable. Use their data only for specified purposes and related or compatible purposes. Only collect and keep data needed for those purposes. Take reasonable steps to ensure that the data are accurate, relevant, timely, and complete. Let people access, challenge, and correct the data you are holding. Use appropriate safeguards to avoid loss, destruction, and unauthorized access, modification, use, or disclosure of the data. And be held accountable for doing all of the above. These principles were forward thinking at the dawn of the computer age, but how they are implemented today can deliver, deliver little real privacy protection. For one thing, they let someone collect, use, and share a lot of data with notice and consent. That may sound like it preserves the data subject's autonomy and control, but the law upholds forms of consent that most people would not consider truly informed or voluntary. When did any of us last read a website privacy policy or a cookie notification before clicking our consent to it? I rarely do it, and I'm a lawyer. But whether I've read it or not, whether I can realistically reject the service, like internet search or not, I'm bound by my click. Ironically, having loose legal standards for consent could help TDM and make it easier to secure and use personal data. But it really doesn't help much. As the gulf widens between the terms that we all mindlessly click through and our real and evolving sense of what is right and proper to do with personal data, black letter compliance with the law won't satisfy our need to assure subjects, funding agencies, collaborators, and the public that research has been conducted responsibly. The way the consent aspect of the FIPS has played out in law is part of a larger problem with privacy law. Even with so many privacy laws on the books, scholars argue that compliance has become more about form than substance. To quote Ari Waldman, privacy law increasingly suffers from legal indigeneity. What he means by this is that rather than constraining or guiding the behavior of regulated entities, Privacy law is actually shaped by ideas emerging from the space the law seeks to regulate, something we also tend to refer to as regulatory capture. This is because privacy law standards are so broadly worded that compliance professionals on the ground have significant power to define what the law means in practice. When given that opportunity, compliance professionals often frame the law in accordance with managerial values like operational efficiency and reducing organizational risk, rather than the substantive goals the law is meant to achieve. Privacy scholars and other stakeholders have urged lawmakers to inject substance back into privacy law by shifting the focus from obtaining consent to preventing and punishing real privacy-related harms. The law is unsettled on exactly what the range of those harms should be, and the consent paradigm has been hard to dislodge. An empirical study by Joel Reidenberg and others at the Fordham Center on Law and Information Policy showed that the data privacy harms people care most about, the ones they claim most often in class action lawsuits or regulatory enforcement actions, are unauthorized disclosure, surreptitious collection, failure to secure, and undue retention. And as I mentioned in earlier videos, some courts and state legislatures are starting to pay more attention to how big data and the internet may contribute to such harms and revise what we reasonably should expect people to be able to do with our public statements and information. What does all of this mean for TDM research? For one thing, it means that while complying with the law is important, it isn't enough, at least not yet. In many cases, it will play a subordinate role to ethics and institutional norms in addressing key questions about the right and best ways to handle personal data and research. This makes sense because, as Waldman noted, practitioners shape the contours of privacy law. Privacy law has actually always relied a great deal on self-regulation by communities dealing with data. 
So how researchers develop norms for getting, using, and publishing personal data is critical, not just to filling today's gaps in privacy protections for data subjects and minimizing any privacy law risk researchers may confront, but to building more robust privacy law itself. It may also help reassure data sources with whom we would like to collaborate. And speaking of collaboration, that brings us to the subject of the next video, International Collaborations and the European General Data Protection Regulation.